Lord Darcy found the NHS to be in critical condition and he said major reform is urgently overdue. Let's talk about this to Dr John Puntis who is co-chair of the Keep Our NHS Public Campaign Group and he's a retired consultant paediatrician. Doctor, good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for Hello, joining us. Hello. So 7.62 million people languishing on NHS waiting lists. I suppose most of them wouldn't be able to afford private health care. Some of them will object to it on moral grounds. How about you? What would you think if they just paid to go privately? Well, let me just first of all say that when the NHS was properly funded, and you know, less than 10 years ago, it was rated as one of the best systems in the world. So there's been a huge change over recent years. And I think Darcy did put his finger on uh, one of the important causes, which is austerity and underinvestment in the NHS. I understand people wanting to go privately because the NHS is currently providing a poor service. Of course, that fuels a turn towards the private sector. But the governments have also deliberately promoted the private sector over recent years by encouraging or demanding contracting out of service, joint ventures between NHS trusts and private companies, also supporting the private sector during the COVID pandemic, effectively giving them a big handout to keep them uh, going. So I don't think that if the NHS was funded properly and improved, I don't think people would be looking to the private sector. A few might do. They wouldn't go away completely, but there wouldn't really be any need to go private. But when you say if the NHS were funded properly, isn't that just a bottomless pit of endless expense to the point that it's a dream, it's a vision, it's a utopian vista, the idea of a properly funded NHS. But I don't remember any time in my life or broadcasting career when anyone has sat back and said, well, today, what do we think about the NHS? Oh, we think it's perfectly funded, it's adequately funded. That's never been the case, has it? There's always been a level of, you know, failure to supply demand because demand soars and roars away. The more successful the NHS is, the longer we live, the greater our demands, the more multifarious the inventions of new medication or procedures, the more our demands and the more expensive everything becomes. It's one of these, these uh, unfortunate situations where the success is rewarded by this gaping vacuum needing more and more money. No, I think it's a nonsense to say it's a bottomless pit. And as I said, Going back 10 years or so, performance was much better, satisfaction of the public was much better, and this was directly related to the last Labour government increasing funding of the NHS so that it more matched comparable European countries. So it's very clear that if you are prepared to invest in NH services, satisfaction goes up, waiting lists go down, and things actually improve because of that investment. But don't we have a parlous situation of failure to recruit, failure to retain nurses, doctors, doctors saying they're going to work abroad, take their very expensive NHS training with them and just hightail it out of the country? Don't we have a situation where it isn't simply, though I know it's not simple, but it isn't simply money that's needed, but many more other facets are needed to, to engender any level of satisfaction. And one of them is massive investment in social care, because at the moment we've got hospital beds that are full because we can't get patients home because the social care system has crumbled. Absolutely. And it's criminal that governments aren't tackling the issue of social care. And you're quite right. Something like one in seven beds have patients in who are fit to go home, but can't go home because there's no community support. And this is one of the reasons why hospitals get blocked up, why there's, as Darcy pointed out, 14,000 patients dying every year because they're in a and &E. they've been assessed as needing admission because they're very sick, but there's no bed immediately available. They stay in a and &E until a bed is found and the risk of dying goes up as the hours tick by. And not to mention the ambulances waiting on hospital forecourts to disgorge very sick patients because they can't, because there's there's no no vacuum in which to disgorge them. So that and the, the highly qualified ambulance crew have to sit on forecourts for hours and hours a day in the ambulances waiting to get their patients into hospital so they can go and, co and collect the others who desperately need them. I mean, it's a really invidious situation, isn't it? Absolutely. So you you're absolutely right. I have no disagreement. Social care 
has to be tackled and it should be part of any discussions about reforming the NHS. It has to be part of that. You don't get that from the Darcy report. Therefore, Doctor, when you hear somebody say, and I'm sure you do, people say it all the time, I certainly hear them saying it all the time, well, I'm going privately, I'm going private. There's, an, there's a, for example, a, a private A&E that people can visit quite near where I live and people are forever nipping off there in order to, you know, they, I think it costs £120, maybe £150 or something like that just to go and you could leave with your antibiotics prescription or you can leave with a referral for an x-ray or you can leave with a diagnosis that actually you're fine it's just a virus you'll get better soon or whatever it is but you can at least if you have a child that falls off some on a horrible you know slide in a playground you can take your child there very quickly pay your 120 quid or 150 or whatever it is lots of people are using that kind of facility just to get seen quickly when you hear that do you feel that that is good because they ease the burden on the nhs or do you feel that that is bad because we shouldn't have to be doing that kind of thing well if you have a serious accident or you've got a very complex condition you're not be going, you won't be going to the private sector and the problem one of the big problems is that and you know this very well there is only one pool of staff and staff are trained by the nhs and if staff go to work in the private sector they're not available to the nhs so this is a big problem i think for example when more elective hip surgery was increased in the private sector, there was actually a concomitant fall in the NHS, so the overall number stayed about the same. And the problem with investing in the private sector and encouraging people to go there is it actually does take staff away and it undermines NHS services. And we've seen this very clearly with cataract surgery, uh, and in this report from the uh, Private Health Information Network, I know they don't distinguish between patient admissions, patients who have a health insurance, and those who've been sent by the NHS to the private sector. And the majority of cataracts are now done in the private sector, but paid for by the NHS. The private sector doesn't want to take on complex cataracts, and it doesn't want to take on conditions that are going to make you blind if you're not treated promptly. Mm. So the more complex stuff is left to the NHS, which has less staff, its team working and its training is being disrupted by outsourcing to the private sector. So it's a complicated situation. Thank you very much for joining me. That's Dr John Huntis there from the Keep Our NHS Public Group.